These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the court officials, and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, all the artisans and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, son of Shaphan, and Gamariah, son of Hilkiah, whom King Zedekiah of Judah sent to Babylon to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. It said this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there, and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and to pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promises and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for your harm, to give you a future with a hope. In this, the 29th chapter of Jeremiah, the unpopular prophet was sent a letter to those Israelites who have found themselves in exile in Babylon. It was not by chance or a strange twist of fate that brought them there. On the contrary, God had warned them of what was to come because of their unwillingness to obey the will of and to do the work required by the great I am. God had done all that could be done. God warned them, blessed them, liberated them, fed them, protected them, taught them, rescued them, healed them, delivered them, spoke to them, empowered them, strengthened them, and made their enemies fall before them. But nothing seemed to work. At every possible turn in the road, they chose every way but the way of the Lord. If God said to them, go left, they'd find every excuse in the book to go right. And then grumble against God when things had turned out unlike they had planned or hoped for. How could God have done this? These weren't just any people, no. These were the Israelites. They were God's chosen, set-apart, peculiar people. They were the ones with whom God chose to build and establish relationship and covenant. These were the people that God loved. What a turn of events. Jerusalem's proverbial underdogs who always seem to come out on top were now in exile. I can hear the voice of those who knew their history, the ones who who had seen the Israelites decline. You know, the onlookers, the haters, as we would call them. I can hear them now. Oh, those chosen people, they have been defeated. Their homes have been destroyed. Their cities are no competition for the weapons of warfare used by the adversary. Their God has failed them and their temples lay in ruin. And now their people are divided. I can hear the haters say their luck has finally run out. It was just a matter of time. Case closed. The end. Game is over. And for so many, the story ends here in exile. 
I don't know, maybe you can relate. Those that once saw you in the prime of your promised land now see you in the perils of prison, exiled, and have dismissed you altogether. She has been defeated, they say. Her luck has finally run out. The verdict is in and the case is closed. But I hope you see the revelation in Jeremiah's 29th chapter because despite the devastation Israel faced and Jerusalem's utter destruction, Jeremiah was writing to those in exile. This says to me that despite every effort to be wiped out, they survived. In spite of their self-defeating bad habits, they were still here, reading the words of the prophet who had tried to warn them, spoken by the same God who had chosen them so many generations ago, the same God who had now brought them back into exile. Regardless of how many or how deep the downs were, somehow they made it. Somehow they survived. While you're able to relate to Israel's exile, I hope you can recognize and relate to God's love and mercy in your very own breath. You too, ladies of Lee Arendelle, you have survived. Though you may not have selected the right answers to every test given to you in life's school of hard knocks, you survived. When the years of abuse, unrelenting, bruised your body and scarred your mind, you thought you'd never make it through. But guess what? You survived. When violence, addiction, and crisis had you barely a breath away from death, you survived. The bills piled up, and when, and when you were unsuccessfully searching for that proverbial 15 cents of which you thought you'd make a dollar, you still survived. When when friends and family who promised to always be there suddenly disappeared. When your present situation seemed so dark you couldn't tell which way was up, you survived. When the realities of prison set in and the tears that wet your face would not stop, it rendered you hopeless, it rendered you helpless, it rendered you depressed. But guess what? You have survived. As amazing and as wonderful as this is, as grateful as we ought to be, we must remember that just as Jeremiah reminds the exiled people of Israel that while they have been blessed enough to survive, God is calling them to live. Jeremiah tells the people, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and, and eat what they produce. Multiply there and do not decrease. Jeremiah does not tell the people of Israel to wait until they're free in order to live. Instead, he tells them to live where they are. During the year that I interned here at Lee Arendelle, I met so many women who had somehow managed to press pause on their lives. Looking forward to the possibility of being released, they were here in exile, just killing time. I'm just going to do my time and go home. And day by day, waiting for a return to their Jerusalem in order to live again, they sat and waited. But my sister's complacency is not what God has called for in this exile. Instead, there is a call to live and to multiply, to invest and produce fruit right here in barren land. Even in this place of exile, of, of separation, God is expecting you to produce good fruit. Well, I know what you're thinking. That sounds all fine and dandy, but how do you live in exile? I'm glad you asked. Jeremiah tells the people first to pray. Easy enough, right? It's not any prayer, though. It's a prayer for the city in which they are in exile. See, God knew when speaking this through Jeremiah exactly who the Israelites really were. God had known that their tendency in crisis was to grumble, to complain, and to focus on themselves. 
In the same way, God knows us. God knows that the thing we tend to do in exile is pray for our own immediate release. Lord, get me out of here. Touch the judge, Lord. Yes, touch the judge as only as only you can, Lord. Yes, yes. Let let them be merciful, Lord. Soften the hearts of the parole board, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes. Grant me freedom and release from this land. See, God knows exactly who Jeremiah is writing to. So before they pray for themselves, Jeremiah instructs them to pray for their enemy, pray for their oppressors. What he was calling them to do is to take into account the genuine welfare of the enemy. See, the word welfare here in Hebrew means shalom, peace. Let me put it into perspective. An officer who is catching hell is probably likely to give you hell. So pray for their peace. When your bunkie is troubled, she'll probably give you some trouble. So pray for her peace. Pray for the peace of those who are warring on the inside because they are liable to open fire on anyone at any time. So pray for their peace. See, when God gives peace. Don't you know that an enemy who has peace in his or her heart, who finds that divine shalom, can't stir up and won't stir up any mess in your life. So by virtue of them having peace, we all will have peace in exile. Pray for their peace. Pray for their welfare. Pray for their shalom. The next lesson that Jeremiah teaches us in his letter to the Israelite exiles is that this will be a long haul. They would remain in Babylon for 70 years. That was almost double the amount of time that their predecessors spent wandering in the wilderness. Can you imagine 70 years? Some people don't even live that long. It was a tough pill to swallow, so much so that there were those exiles who refused to accept it. Maybe you've run into them before. You know, they, they, they spoke life to their situation. They, they began to say fluffy, cushy, soft words, promising themselves and others things that they simply could not provide. They declared that joy was coming in the morning, not any morning, but joy would be here tomorrow morning and freedom was coming in the near future. They did these things falsely and in the name of God. Of them, the prophet Jeremiah writes, do not let the prophets and diviners who are among you deceive you and don't listen to the dreams that they dream for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. See, sometimes we get so helpless and and so hopeless in exile that we can't and we don't want to face the truth. We'd rather find rest in a lie that sounds good than build a home in a truthful word that is solid but harsh. We deceive ourselves asking others to lie to us, to shield us from the pain of the truth. But it is that precise experience when we allow ourselves to experience the cold, harsh winters that life sometimes brings. That's what enables us to find comfort in the onset of spring. So be careful in hiding from the truth In rebuking the challenges of life, do not listen to the dreams they dream, says Jeremiah. For it is a lie. I did not send them, says the Lord. The prophet's letter teaches us that there is a plan. There is a hope. And there is a future. Yes, this exile may last a lifetime, but God has a plan. Yes, others may have written you off, but God still sees your future. Yes, there may be dark nights up ahead, but there is still a hope. 
It may not seem like it now, but but do what Jeremiah says and, and keep on living. Why? Because God has a plan. Look at Joseph, the one who dreamed dreams, blessed with the gift of vision, and yet he was cast several times into exile, but God had a plan. Consider the three exiles, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, thrown into the fiery furnace. The outlook didn't seem promising, but God had a plan. When I think about my Savior, when I think about Jesus living exiled as an inmate on death row, when I think about the Lord stretched wide and, and hung high and pierced on the executioner's cross, the outlook seemed bleak, but God had a plan. So I don't know about you here today, but I find comfort in knowing that God has a plan. Not just any plan, no, but one that includes a future and a hope. 1 Corinthians 13 reminds us that when it has all been said and done, only three things remain, faith, love, and hope. In spite of this exile, be it 70 days or weeks or 70 years, God has a plan for your life. He has not given up on you. Let me say that again. God has not given up on you. In truth, your family may have given up on you. Your friends may have given up on you. The courts may have given up on you. The judge may have thrown the book at you, but God has not given up on you. Others may struggle to get beyond your past, but God knows your future. We have the advantage that the Israelites in exile didn't have. See, we know the hope is to be found in Christ. But just keep on living, keep on praying, and keep on believing on that hope, the hope found in Jesus. It is a hope that enables us to live in exile. So do as Jeremiah instructs the Israelites, build houses, but build it on that hope. Pray for the land of your exile, but, but pray in that hope. Invest, but invest in that hope, for God has a plan for your future and for your hope. Mm -hmm.